welcome back to episode two of this season. We're talking about Holy Envy, and you all are probably envious of my wonderful friend here, the Maharat, Rory Pickernese, um, who we decided the title Maharat is way cooler than Doctor, but this is the Doctors Are In podcast. So where we left off at the last one, you were talking about how um, it's okay to disagree or even, you know, dare I say, like, be wrong as you're wrestling through scripture. And this is part number two that I want to get into in the ways that how you help me just be better. Like, let's just leave that as a blanket statement. Like, I'm better because Rory's in my life. And I'm a better Christian and pastor with this idea that you really helped kind of open my eyes up to. In our Christian tradition, there is a little bit of this fear. I don't know if fear is the word I want here. Awareness with potential repercussions. There's a scripture in the New Testament that talks about if you lose, you grieve the Holy Spirit. And this idea of could you lose salvation? I mean, that that's one of the big buzzwords in our camp. You know, this idea of, of salvation in Jesus and can you lose that? Is there anything you can do um, to affect that? Um, and for many people, it becomes almost a barrier, a box. It is unbeknownst I think to some people it will really affect their theology and their understanding of God and relationship like to scripture like you don't want to be wrong about scripture because if you're wrong about scripture then maybe the Holy Spirit will leave you and maybe you're not saved anymore and 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 like it it becomes a slippery slope but you kind of blew my mind when we were talking about this once where you're like what do you mean you stop being Christian like that concept is not in your story and theology so do you know where I'm going with this where you want to pick it up well, first of all, I think it's actually really important. I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction first, but you when can When she does this, it's always great, so just hang on, all right? It's going to be worth well, it. But I think it's important to acknowledge the ways in which our two traditions developed. So Christianity, by and large, and particularly, I would imagine, Protestant and Methodism, develop in majority contexts. And so, yes. and you exist right now in a majority context where Judaism has, for the overwhelming majority of our history, existed as a minority community. I mean, we can talk about Jewish sovereignty three times in all of human history, and none of them have lasted more than 80 years so far to date. So, let alone talking about even Jewish majority in places. And so, there's a very different concept context that we're talking about. And I think it's important because None of the things that we talk about are kind of, I don't know if the right way to say this, but like objectively true, right? Like these are things that individuals yes. have created in terms of these structures. We we are talking about, you and I are two stories that have intersected. This is how your story is affecting mine. I don't re represent all of the Methodist tradition. You don't represent every single understanding of Judaism, but something between us, besides the fact that she's amazing and adorable and I love you, um... Uh, I love Something. her flattery, most of all. That's what it takes, right. But, yes, go ahead. So I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, so I just, I name that to say, like, in the Jewish tradition, I think that there was a very different attitude in terms of, like, we couldn't be that quick to kick people out. And by the way, even if we wanted to kick people out, we often couldn't kick people out because the societies in which we lived forced Jews to live in restricted areas, or we were forced to have... Jew written on our identification, on our passport, that was our nationality in mm -hmm. most of the countries that the Jewish community lived in diaspora, outside of any kind of sovereign, um, particularly land of Israel, but any kind of sovereign Jewish community. So we couldn't really talk about what does it mean for someone to stop being Jewish. So now that doesn't mean there's not real theology behind it, but I just want to name the fact that even yeah. if Jews wanted to, we couldn't. Plus, we played a numbers game. So like... Like, we're already way behind. We're going to start kicking people out? Like, we can't afford that. Yeah. In Which, a way that I think Christianity could. And so that's a, that's a big part of the story, is a story of having power, maintaining power, and having a, I don't want to say luxury, that sounds too good, right? But, like, having the freedom to say that even if we lose people, we still hold such huge numbers that we can fine-tune over things that maybe others wouldn't have even quibbled over. And I wonder, leaning into that, like, if if we look at the very beginning of Christianity, when it was still mm -hmm. considered a minority and persecuted and things like that, and that seemed to be a lot more true. And it's when it becomes a dominant power, when it becomes uh, enough 
numbers, what's that? They reach a quota where, you know, that's when we start seeing, okay, now we're splitting, right? Now we're having, well, if you believe this, then I'm going to believe this, and you're not part of our group anymore, and, like, so there's some truth to that, I think. Right, yeah. exactly. And so we have, like, in our tradition, there's a point in the Talmud, in the oral tradition, where it even says explicitly, um, I think it says in the, I'll try to impress you again and pull out the Hebrew, oh, but I think it says, um, Yisrael, Afal Pishachata, Yisrael Hu, which means an Israelite, even when he sins, remains an Israelite, remains mm-hmm. a Jew. Like You don't get to just decide that because someone has gone astray that they no longer get to be part of the community. Now, what that also means, though, and getting back to the context that you wanted to talk about this, is that there's a lot more freedom in terms of how we maneuver because we're not trying to walk this fine line where all of a sudden if you accidentally touch something or if your toe Mm -hmm. slips out of the water, then someone could say, oh, you're no longer a part of it. And I find that to be especially interesting when doing text study and particularly when I've done text study with Christians where with Jews there's much more this this sense of like we're going to try an idea on for size Mm -hmm. is it where I'm going to end up I don't know but I have to see and and also I can't know that this idea is not the right idea until I try it and I see and I find when I do that sometimes with Christians they get really nervous Mm -hmm. because even me positing a theoretical can can risk feeling like you're starting to lose that theology or you're going yeah. to risk that salvation. And so the way that I've started to talk about it sometimes, and I don't know if it resonates or not with other people, but I like, is like going into a store and trying on an outfit where sometimes, like if you're going clothes shopping, sometimes you pick something up that you know you're never going to buy, but you're just like, I'm going through the store and I'm not sure if in this store I'm a small, medium or large. And so I'm just going to pick up an outfit and put on this shirt because I need to know, because why do I keep wasting my time looking at everything? I need to just know what size I am. Or I don't, I won't know if this color looks nice until I put it on my skin. By the way, everything's going to look great on her, but yes, go on. Right. Like, so the sense where like sometimes, right. Or like Mm -hmm. in the store, they have a number of things that are yellow and I'm like, I can't get away with yellow. And your friend says, sure you can. And you say, you know what, let me try on this shirt just to see. And I might say like, I know I don't want this shirt, but I'm not going to go and yeah, start going through the dress rack until I've sort of narrowed it down. Yeah. So sometimes you try something on because you think I'm going to really like it. You put it on, you realize it was wrong. Sometimes you try it on because and I know I've done this, I think this is going to look hideous, but you try it on and you're like, oh, that actually lays Fantastic. totally differently yeah. when it's on me. And sometimes it's you're trying to just eliminate something and then you're pleasantly surprised yeah. or you're proven correct. But sometimes it's like that with ideas. And so you might posit something and you might say, like, so the example I used in the last episode was... Abraham, was God testing Abraham right. with the sacrifice of Isaac? And so when I'm doing that with people, I might have to say the question, like, is God just trying to be cruel in asking Abraham to sacrifice his only his, his last remaining child? And you might say, like, that's a horrible thing. Of course God's not yeah, cruel. Yeah, we can't, we can't go down that route because if we did, then that would mean this and this. You're right. No, I don't think, I don't believe God is cruel, but I have to play it out. I mm-hmm. don't know. How can I say God's not cruel until I say, okay, could God just be being cruel? Well, then why not? Yeah. Like, because the, the reality is, is that I think the story necessitates that that's a question. And if you ignore the question... You're never going to get to the answer. And if the only reason that you can maintain a faith that God is good is by ignoring things in which God appears not to be good, then that's not real faith. That's just a blind obedience. So we're going to have to try it on. Could God be just cruel in this story? I don't think that's what's happening. But what's my proof text? Well, clearly there's other things that are at stake that are happening. I think there's a lesson God is trying to teach Abraham. I think there's a process that Abraham needs to have to go through. And I could potentially pick up other texts for why I think that is. But I have to try it on for size, even just so that I can say, here's why I know it doesn't fit. And you know, running with that analogy, what it does for me then, this idea of, I'm calling it an assurance of salvation, but if it's this idea that I can, when you go clothes shopping, you bring your best friend with you because you're like, even if I try something awful on, yeah, they may joke about it or may say, no, that's not right, but it's not like I'm going to lose that friendship. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of the circles I've been in, like there are times I'm like, you know what? I have never read 
queer theology or any of these things because in my context, like it was very clearly stated, if you go down that route, you won't be one of us anymore. And so it, it limits you. And so for this, it was like, when you know that there is nothing that you can do that would make you stop being part of, I want to say that identity, but it's also a community. Yeah. Then you're like, okay, well, let me try. Let me risk. Let me say, okay, this is a season where I don't feel like I want to do X, Y, and Z, but I want to do this and this instead. And that's okay. I'm not a bad person, a bad person of faith. It it takes the guilt away of right. all of it, right? I, I think it absolutely does. And that's why in my analogy, trying it on doesn't mean you're buying it. Right. Right. Like you ultimately decide what you're going to buy. And you know, we can, some of us spend more time in the store than others, or some of us have to go back numerous times. So, you know, some of us have to make sure that like there are matching t-shirts. So when we go to the store, we look the same and everyone knows that we're best friends. And some of us forget to wear the right matching t-shirt when all the other friends are wearing it that day. Oh, that's going to be another episode. Let me tell you, it was, (laughs) it was something. So let me, let me wrap it up kind of with this, because you also touched on something I want to do in the next episode, but like, what that did for me, like to translate into into my context is like, you really helped me understand grace. Like there is, I, I don't know how many times I've gotten up on a Sunday and say, oh, there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. And yet been afraid to be like, I can't even, I can't read this. I can't think about this. I can't stop doing this or else I would be a bad pastor, a bad Methodist, etc. Like, so you gave me that grace and you told me what kind of Wesley talked about this idea of, you know, there are a lot of ways we come to God. And obviously scripture is important. It's it's important to both of us in our context, but also that God gave us a brain. Like we're supposed to reason and rest, wrestle with it. And that's um, why I feel like if you have that ground that says, go ahead, wrestle, figure this out, and you may just blow up in the process. Okay, great. We learned something. Like that just gave me a piece to be able to try on all these things I didn't know. So thank you for that on top of all things. But what I want to do here in this last episode when we get together is kind of talk about this idea of what does it mean when your identity is formed as one that's always a minority that doesn't have um, the power in the system and and how that your understanding of the role of, of justice, like, yes, I have this community that will never kick me out and I have been called to this community to stand up and do something is where I'm going to go in the where we're going to go next. So we'll be right back for episode three.